Today, Ray's keynote talk will be about riddle coma enthrallment and the neuroreceptor theater. Please let us welcome Professor Ray Lannebach. Somebody left uh, their book, more, uh, more Cunning Than Man, here. It's the Rat, Complete History of the Rat and its Role in Human Civilization. Okay. So first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me here. and, and um, Thank you for coming early in the morning on a Saturday. And thank you, Leah, for that very generous uh, intro. Um, I'm going to um, not go into where my research came out of, uh, the, sort of the prehistory of the prehistory of my research. Uh, so I'll go right into um, uh, the event itself. But, but I'm going to, uh, you, you know, I, I'm not sure what the, the term is or the name for the Pleiades in Finnish. The Pleiades, are you familiar with the Pleiades? It's the, the, the stars called, the, I think, the Seven Sisters? Oh, okay. Uh, you know how when you try to see the Pleiades, you can't if you look directly at them? Uh, so that the way that you see the Pleiades is to, is to use your rods rather than your fovea. Uh, because the fovea does not have the sensitivity to low light that the rods have. So if you look next to the Pleiades, then you can see the Pleiades if you look at them. So it's this uh, sort of shuttling back and forth, trying to see that which you cannot see uh, frontally, uh, 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 direct. So, um, I'm going to attempt to gaze, um, but not directly, and, and to, to gaze askance at, at the, the topic that I'm talking about today. Somehow I'm going on and off the, the sound. Okay, the, this paper has five acts. First one is proposition, stylus. Second is encryption. Mathematics. Third is molecular thrall. The fourth is the trope, Boss John Otter and precarity. The fifth is the aftermath, riddle coma. So, the proposition. So, um, I think it was the day just before or just after my tenth birthday, and I. Uh, it was, I remember it was snowing, and it was a, a big storm, it was one of the, the March storms that end winter, and uh, in Boston, or I was just outside of Boston. And, and I came down for breakfast, and my mother uh, was in the kitchen, and, and I remember that when I came into the room, she turned. And I remember that turn. And, and when she turned, she hesitated, and then she she held out a glass uh, to me, and, and it was tiger's milk. Uh, every morning we would have tiger's milk, and tiger's milk was this constantly changing substance, which always tasted really horrible. It it it, it had a base of of uh, brewer's yeast and 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 whatever else uh, my mother had decided was really important for us to to have in the morning, and and. Um, uh, my health today is definitely a result of tiger's milk. I don't know why I got the name tiger's milk. Um, it wasn't, uh, but but um, we pretended it was, I guess. And um, so she said um, that actually the tiger's milk today was going to be different, and, and we were going to delay breakfast for a while. And um, that she would um, join me in the tiger's milk, which she always did anyway. Uh, and uh, she said that um, this tiger's milk was a bit different because it would, 
help me to see with my grandfather's eyes. Okay, and, and that was odd. Uh, but it was particularly odd because my grandfather had died two weeks before. Her, her father had died two weeks before. And um, so it was a bit macabre uh, as well as odd. Uh, but I figured it was a, kind of an adult ritual, uh, that a, kind of a morning ritual that adults do. Uh, I was ten. I, you know, this is ushering into the, the kind of the family ritual. Um, so I took the tiger's milk. I drank the tiger's milk. It, it tasted really horrible as always, uh, but particularly horrible that day. And and then I, I wanted to uh, get. Uh, out of her sphere for a while. Uh, uh, she still had control of my orifices uh, at the age of 10. That was just slightly disturbing and something, you know, which I wanted to sort of limit uh, as much as I could. So I, I left, I, I went um, into the family library and, and uh, we had a 78 uh, 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 record player there. 78 RPM, and, and next to it was uh, Edward R. Moreau's uh, um, I Can Hear It Now, which I really loved. I loved listening to that, the, the, that set of records, uh, because they, they had ambient sounds. I don't know if you've ever heard it. Uh, it had ambient sounds, and those ambient sounds were behind um, Hitler, for example, or Mussolini, or uh, other other politicians of the day, and that that listening to the that depth of sound was something that absolutely enthralled me. Uh, so I, I put it on and and I began to watch the the record as I listened to it, and as I was watching, I became quite hypnotized by the, by the record. And I began to look at the, the, the needle and the stylus. And then I, I, I found uh, my father's magnifying glass, which was on the desk across the room, and I brought it over. And I began to look very carefully at uh, the stylus and at the record. And, and I noticed that the, you know, I, my, my concept of a record at that time was that, that it was a series of grooves and that the, the stylus was in the grooves and, and played the grooves and, and each song or each, each section of the record was, a, was a, a, a different groove. But as I looked at it, I began to realize that it was a single groove. And, that, uh, and, and while I was looking at the stylus, I, and I felt that in a sense I was that stylus and I was in that groove. And I, I felt the, the kind of agency of the stylus. But, but then I gradually began to realize that actually the stylus had no agency at all, that it was the groove that had the agency. It was the groove that was pulling the stylus uh, toward the center of the record. And, and that the stylus was still, uh, it, 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 it picked up information, but it was absolutely still. And I, I looked around the room and I began to imagine that I was still and the room moved uh, around me and that, that everything was uh, in a parallax uh, 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 around my, my, uh, um, my um, visual apparatus. And I looked at the stylus in the groove and I noticed that at the center of the record there was a spindle, the thing in the middle. And, and I noticed that the, the, the stylus moved toward the spindle. And then I realized that the spindle, to me, represented death. And, and that the, the, the stylus was being drawn inexorably to the spindle and to death. And I was angry. I was envious that the, or not envious, but angry that the spindle uh, was in the center and that death was in the center. And I, I was thinking, well, why can't death be on the margin? Why can't it be on the edge? Why does it have to be in the center? And, and then, I, uh, then I began to think, well, why does it have to be there at all? Oh, you know, why is death there? And 
um, maybe it was the setup by my mother that I was looking through my grandfather's eyes <coughs> that made me think about this. But I, I was watching it, and the video seems to have stuck for some reason. But um, as I was watching it, then the hypnosis began to take hold. And, and I became drawn also with the stylus toward the center. And I, I looked through the magnifying glass and I saw this ball of dust on the stylus and, and I, I began to examine that. And then as I was, I was looking at it, um, uh, my father came into the room and he was naked. And, and as I was, uh, as I turned to, to see him, and I was sitting down, and he was standing, and I, but I couldn't recognize even what he was. Uh, I, I couldn't, it wasn't just who he was, but what he was. And then I saw his penis, and his penis was sort of swinging languidly from side to side, as, and the, the hypnosis of the record became kind of the hypnosis of his penis. And, and, um, and then I, I looked back at the record and, and, and then looked at him again and then I smelled him. And, and when I smelled him, I realized that it was my daddy. And, and then I looked back at the record and, and, uh, and uh, I began to smell everything in the room. I smelled the books on the shelf. I smelled the rugs on the floor. I smelled the, the, the space and the wood in the room. And then I threw up. And I threw up on the record. And, and he, he grabbed the wastebasket next to the, the desk and he put it in front of my head and I found myself in a little room. Uh, and the little room had no, no windows or doors, but it had this kind of gooey mass on the, on the floor. And, and more of that gooey mass was coming out of my mouth and, and my whole body was having these retro, um, uh, uh, these, uh, um, peristal these retro peristaltic motions and from my asshole to my, to my mouth and I felt that I was turning inside out and I was being eviscerated from within and I continued to throw up. And, and I reached in to the, to the little room and I felt this gooey stuff and, and I, I smelled it, and it smelled like earwax, I remember. And, and then I tasted it and, and it, and I threw up again. And, and, uh, and then uh, gradually the, the, um, con the convulsion stopped, and he took the wastebasket away and uh, went out to the, uh, the bathroom to get a towel to, to clean the, the record player. And uh, meanwhile, I was looking at the, the window, and I noticed that the window was crystalline. And, and, uh, and I noticed that outside, the, the trees were crystalline, and the, the snow, and everything was incredibly uh, crystal. Everything seemed like crystal, and the wood in the room began to have this crystalline quality to it as well. He came in, and he began to talk to me, and he said, it's fine, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful. And then he began to talk to me about the tiger's milk. And he said, you know, the, the tiger's milk that, that um, mom gave you this morning was a bit different than the normal tiger's milk. And, and it has some cactus in it. And, and he began to store information in me that I did not understand at that time. Uh, and the information was about dopamine and, and serotonin and, and my nervous system. And he said that, that uh, the cactus and, and humans uh, have been co-evolving, and and um, and I realized later I didn't understand it at the time, but I realized later that he was storing this information in me uh, for later use. And then he took a book off the shelf of the library and, and read a couple of lines to um, uh, to me, and I didn't understand understand it. And he put it back. And later I realized uh, uh, when I went to the, the, li the library years later that it was Aldous Huxley's uh, The Doors of Perception that he had read a bit to me. And, uh, and then I wanted to leave, to leave him and to leave the, the library and I wanted to go outside uh, and into the snow. And, and I went downstairs and my mother was sitting in a rocking chair and, um, and she was absolutely still still and I, I, I began to cry because I thought that she was dead and I went over to her and um, 
and just looked at her for a few minutes and then I, I touched her and, and when I touched her she opened her eyes and she turned to me and she said, how are you? <laughs> and I had no idea what to say. And, and um, then I said, I want to go outside, will you come with me? And she said, no. Um, and then she um, hesitated for a long time and then she said, go, go see for yourself. Go see yourself. And I went outside. Bastian Johann uh, Christian Otter, Bastian Otter, has kind of bopped to the surface again uh, because his films uh, this year are, are at um, the Arsenale uh, in, in the Venice Biennale. And um, we, we know most of Bastian Otter's films. Um, uh, this is 16 millimeter films and, and, and photographs. We know his work primarily from these. And they are staged um, sequences. Uh, for example, this one, uh, which was Fall One, where he perched absurdly on a chair on, on a house in, in uh, California. And then he purposely tipped to one side and fell first to the overhang and then onto a mattress. In his work, there's always a, a turn, a trope, a, a turn of phrase, a turn of events, a, a material exchange. And all of Otter's following performances begin with the same plot, the positioning of his body in gravitational space then minutely turning and shifting his center of gravity to a point of extreme instability and loss of balance and launching himself into the space between his former position and the earth. Otter experimented over and over again with that moment of transition as the break point of expectation, fear, and possibility of physical harm and death. He said about his actions, I do not make body sculptures, body art, or body works. When I fell off the roof of the house or into a canal, it was because the gravity made itself master over me. This was a strong admission of his debt to uh, physics and to classical mechanics, and it's uh, stated in a very serious manner. Um, and, and perhaps, um, uh, we have, I noticed somebody laughing just a moment ago, and that, that's, that's nice because I noticed that in, in Venice that children would laugh, but adults would look very solemnly at, at his films. And, and particularly artists and, and historians would, would consider them with great solemnity. Um, and, and so I was curious about that. Why is it that we have trouble perhaps seeing the slapstick quality in uh, his performances, the, the sense of utter absurdity uh, in, in uh, his acts as he hangs from the branch. Why can't we take it with levity? I was, I began to think, well, what if um, falling was something that other people did who did it in order to be funny? Or as an exploration of falling also, but an exploration of, of its other uh, uh, humorous side. So Buster Keaton, for example. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> 
<laughs> or Roy Vara. honors acts of falling with solemnity because we know that they may have been his response to the execution of his Calvinist minister father by the Nazis in Holland in 1944 for helping Jews to escape. And perhaps we know that his dalliance with, with precarity would lead him in 1975 at the age of 33 to sail off from Cape Cod in Massachusetts in a one-person, 13-foot uh, pocket cruiser, the ocean wave, and disappear into the Atlantic in his final work entitled In Search of the Miraculous. So perhaps these uh, change our perception of his work. And in that work, uh, that final work, he gave himself over to the ocean as his master. It was, of course, a, a tragic act and seems to me to involve disappearance in the, in the manner that a two-year-old child might explain and replay the mysterious and traumatic disappearance of his father. Now, can his falls, which are wedged between profound childhood trauma and death, then be read as a tragic prequel? They are unremittingly serious, but they're also humorous and absurd. Oddly, Adder himself and everyone around him and those who have written about him align with his use of the word falling when describing his work. It's a pre-Newtonian word. Um, that is interesting for its power to enthrall us in spite of the evidence. At least it's not as old as that other enthrallment which we uh, say, I, I'm not sure actually in Finnish if this is said. Um, in English we say the sun go, um, um, comes up in the, and goes down. Comes up in the morning goes down, right? Which is a pre um, uh notion of the physics of the solar system. Why do these still exist in our vocabulary? What is it that holds their thrall over us. Of course, the fall had a mythic dimension, particularly for Adder. Uh, and it goes back to Adam and Eve's fall from innocence, the, the origin of knowledge and of sin. And this was not lost on the, the child of two Calvinist ministers. But the trope of falling ignores Buckminster Fuller's reminder that there is no up and down in the universe. There's only in and out. And indeed, I, I think that Adder's work makes much more sense when you see it as an acquiescence to the pull of the earth rather than falling toward it. Adder, like us, is pulled into the earth and none of us have ever in our lives fallen. While falling implies that one can perhaps regain balance and retake control, pulling is a function of attraction with a subtext of desire. It's an acknowledgement of the power of the earth as other. In her book, Vibrant Matter, Jane Bennett argues that humans encounter a world in which non-human materialities have power, a power that the bourgeois eye and its pretensions to autonomy denies. By claiming that his works were false, Adder reiterated the popular physics terminology of his time. He denied the economy of attraction existing between the, the, his body and the earth, and the power of the earth to enthrall, to force his body into compliance. According to his, uh, one of his biographers, Alexander Dumbatz, uh, Adder was attracted to the phonetic 
similarity of fall and fail, two words that describe the biblical fall from innocence and also just happen to play an important part in Roadrunner cartoons. <laughs> Which are favorites from my childhood, and I think that they were favorites of Boss John Arter, but I can't prove this. by Chuck Jones and, and uh, Michael Maltese, um, uh, which appeared after, after the Second World War, follow a, a well-trodden score or a template in the form of a lesson on the futility of predation, of uh, desire and control in the face of the mechanical dynamics and uh, causality. Wiley Coyote uh, constructs elaborate Rube Goldberg traps for the roadrunner only to always get caught in the gears of his own machinations. Wiley Coyote is doomed to eternal life as a clay pigeon, set up for failure, um, and, and his, his demise is constantly reiterated and constantly repeated. So what interests me in these acts by Wiley Coyote and Adder are the repetitive templates, the causality machine, the, the moment of interpolation when one becomes aware of the repercussions of one's acts. While Adder hides his fear, Wiley Coyote does not. He knows what is about to happen. And he always looks at us at that moment. <laughs> the cartoon is about the flood of adrenaline in his neural pathways as he first believes that he is about to fulfill his alpha predator mandate of catching and eating the roadrunner, only to always have it snatched away from him by the laws of physics. I find myself enthralled by Wiley Coyote's own endlessly repeated enthrallment as he stares in horror at us who serve as the mirror for his impending doom. The etymology of the word thrall and enthrallment can be traced back to the old English thrall, slave, bondman, which is borrowed from Old Norse, thrall. Saying it correctly, it, it now is applied to a state of mind, to chemical dependencies, to addictions, to being under the influence of an object of desire or an experience, such as a psychotropic experience. Molecular thrall. The classic psychedelics, LSD, DMT, mescaline, ayahuasca, ketamine, uh, share structural similarities with neurotransmitters, serotonin, adrenaline, epinephrine, and dopamine. This allows them to cross the blood-brain barrier and to dock with the brain's neuroreceptors. That act of docking is significant because the brain has what is fondly called a, a rich club uh, organization of, of cortical hubs. In the brain, these include the frontal parietal area, the inferior um, temporal managing cortices, the bilateral thalamus, and others. They modulate signal flow in the brain and synchronize neural responses to incoming stimuli, thereby managing and synchronizing the brain's circuits. In 2014, a study by Gareth Bala at London Imperial College uh, combine magnetic resonance imaging and network analysis to find that the rich hub, which forms the spine architecture in all mammalian brains, is already found in the human fetus at 30 weeks, after which a vast number of connections from the core hubs uh, reach out to the other um, uh, and proliferate in the brain, reaching out to other areas of the brain. The hubs exert global homeostatic control over organism mood and behavior. They act as sensory filters and produce our sense of temporal and spatial continuity by integrating the networks closely associated with the, 
the phenomenon of consciousness and selfhood. There have been significant recent studies in, in uh, using MRI scanning uh, to, to detect the effects of, on the brain of LSD-25. The, the scans indicate that the rich club hubs are deactivated uh, in the presence of psychotropics. The, the resulting disintegration, disintegration, disintegration uh, of the hub hierarchies allows the layers of the hierarchies to become manifest and to become active. So disintegration then is accompanied by desegregation of formerly specialized areas of the brain. Diverse functions become less distinct, less hierarchical, more similar to each other, and greater communication is manifested throughout all regions of the brain. With the breakdown of the coherent narrative of the world, uh, usually maintained by the filtering mechanism of the hubs, um, the, the um, um, perception, for example, becomes less predictable, the world becomes less familiar. Robin Carhart, Carhart Harris at the Imperial College London um, argues that MRI uh, research supports constructionist and performative theories of reality, self, mind, and identity. As more parts of the brain are brought into play, a gradual emergence of heightened awareness is accompanied by varying degrees of ego dissolution or ego death. Act two, encryption mathematics. Any intentional release of one's body under the influence of a chemical is founded on proportionality, an assessment of acceptable risks. So it is mathematics and, the proportion, and proportions that set the stage for chemical ingestion. Risk is ever present and generally desired by those who engage in psychotropic research to remind ourselves of the constantly mutating factors that support human life. A renewed awareness of the body as mortal and vulnerable is an important part of the journey. Time, mass, purity, chemical profiles, medical profiles, finance, whoa, oh. Zappa. Yeah. Does Zappa do this to you too? Yeah. yeah. Why? <laughs> it's, it's Zappa, even after death, has <laughs> total control. <laughs> All synapses. Stay away, Zappa. Okay. Um, So a renewed awareness of the body as mortal and vulnerable is an important part of the journey. Time, mass, the, sorry, oh, I've already said that. Thank you, Zappa. The, the, the subject estimates dynamic equations of chemical amounts, grams, milligrams, micrograms, body mass, chemical purity, mode of delivery, of, of previous ingestion, of other medis of medicines, rate of hepatic uh, metabolization. Survival of the organism entails accurate measurement and proportionality. Psychotropics are part of a social and financial exchange system with preparations taking the form of sales, barter, gifts, with or without attached debt. Preparation and ingestion is accompanied by the uh, discrimination and organization of human bodies in space-time. Genders may be mixed or separated, depending on the composition of the affinity group and the, the ideology of the organizers. Often a geometric form, called a circle, uh, in whatever form it takes, is choreographed to control the distribution of bodies of the participants in available space to protect part them from each other and from outside influences. Some people may be barred for any, any number of reasons, including medical or emotional reasons, or cognitive, or political reasons, or age, or ethnicity, class, or caste. A decision is made whether the gathering is a rite of ceremony 
an initiation, or simply an exploration. Usually, the space and the period of ingestion have been distinguished from other spaces and intervals and deemed special. What's my time, by the way? How much time do I have? 25 minutes. One of each of them. Okay, great, thank you. Very okay, great, beautiful. And sometimes there's a theme chosen for the group, uh, or, uh, or it can be just simply individual exploration. There is usually music, which sets up a rhythmic temporality that engineers the structure of the experience and of the trance. Whatever the cultural and social reformation, and sorry, the cultural and social formation, a, cultural, a, a chemical apparatus is brought to bear on transforming a prevailing description of the world, a description that corresponds to a hub-centric organization of the brain. So the previous description of the world, which is culturally cited, is a hub-centric organization, the result of a hub-centric organization in the brain. When undertaken seriously, the act of ingestion is typically a moment of science, and a quest for knowledge of life and death. A psychic clearing is generally established that typically involves abstention from sex, alcohol, other drugs, meat, coffee, stimulants prior to the event. Not always, but often. This allows for a field of reflexive consciousness to be open where cause and effect can be carefully observed. In such a clearing, the subject can observe when one thing leads to another, one act leads to another, when one thing is caused by a previous act. For example, certain cognitive effects can then be traced back to the ingestion of a measured amount of a particular plant or chemical, whereas it would disappear, this would disappear from view in the heavy traffic of daily life. So the preparation of that clearing is a performative declaration of belief in the efficacy of the psychotropic event that follows. But it is also a doorway into, me into the measurement and clearing that desire and greed and the economies of consumption and extinction also enter through. Wiley Coyote is ironically emblematic of these, as he is both a consumer and a victim under threat. Growing, uh, growing times of plants are measured out in decades for peyote, months and years for ayahuasca, weeks for mushrooms, uh, days for the development of synthetic compounds in the lab. There is, there is to date, relatively little awareness and analysis of cultural and ecological impact of hundreds of thousands of North Americans and Europeans ingesting wild products from the Mexican deserts or the Amazon basin and other rainforests. Local mafia involvement follows on the heels of drug tourism. Peyote and the ancient Huicho uh, traditions based on peyote uh, harvesting and, and, the, and the rituals will certainly disappear without state protection. So a, a fundamental contradiction arises that while psychedelics expand the consciousness and integrate self and environment and increase our sensitivity toward the cycles of other species, the economy of desire surrounding these plants work against their survival in the wild and against the survival of indigenous uh, traditions that have utilized them for thousands of years. This also is a function of psychotropic mathematics and proportions. Uh, all right. Act five, aftermath. The psychedelic experience burns its own bridges as it builds them. Like dreams, the memory of the psychotropic experience rapidly decays as everyday reality and the presentation of self returns, but with lingering traces of that experience. In his story, The Riddle of the Universe and Its Solution, Christopher Cherniak, 
describes an encounter between a group of artificial intelligence scientists and an algorithm or a code a viciously circular paradox or a riddle which when read by anyone able to decipher it causes that mind to lapse into a terminal coma from which there is no return. After the, the medical uh, officials uh, eliminate the possibility of a, a biological pathogen or an organism it begins to dawn on them that it is information itself, a string of signs that is causing the brains and the bodies to shut down. But it is impossible to prove this hypothesis without losing another scientist. <laughs> this dream of the perfectly constructed algorithm that shuts down all cortical activity brings to bear a final issue in this short reflection on chemical interference systems. Cherniak's story posits that information itself can have a pathogenic effect on an organism as the membrane between silica-based pathogens and carbon-based organisms is breached. We have long understood that DNA functions as a carbon-based script and as my father explained to me, we appear to be co-evolving with psychotropic plants. We are pulled into them as we pull them into us. When their molecules dock at our neuroreceptors, information is being passed from species to species. What we learn from ayahuasca or peyote or psilocybin or ergot is precisely their substance, their materiality, their beingness, and their encoding. The medium is quite literally and concretely the message, and the me message we receive is most efficiently packaged in the form in another life form, the plant. This opens the possibility that there is a unique evolutionary conjunction between the human brain and the and psychotropic plants that has been co-engineered by both species. Can we escape the conclusion? Oh, 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 I don't want to say this. Um, that, that psychotropics uh, may dock in the brain in order to transmit information, and that this neuroactive transmission from flora to mammalian brains is a peer to peer network. The notion of a riddle coma seems like a dangerous thing, but only if it hasn't already happened. That is, if we have not already been pulled into a continuous state of enthrallment, which we refer to as consciousness. Thank you. then um, 
then what is that communication? What is being communicated? It's actually the, the, um, uh, the molecule itself that is the message. It's the molecule itself. There is no message other than that. So, so, the, so the materiality of, of the, the, the chemical molecule as it attaches to the neuroreceptor is a communication uh, between the, the, you know, uh, um, that molecule and the neuroreceptor. So, so at that level, there is this jump. Um, that's where I'm making the, trying to make the jump. Um, saying that that materiality, that what, what is it that a, a molecule um, uh, transmits? It transmits itself. Yeah, okay, yeah. go. Yes, only small, yes, that's very true and interesting, and probably research will in future focus one point certainly on that level. But isn't it still an uh, interpretation to say that this molecule is a message. It, it is a human interpretation to say that it is a message. Plants aren't ah, yeah, sending yeah, yeah. messages. Yeah. In this um, case, I yeah, I mean, what, what is intention in a Because in plant? May, may I yeah. add still one yeah. thing that, they, yes, they can, uh, plants can send electronic and chemical uh, information, as we know, And but if you eat, if you grab them and eat, then... I'm, I, I can't hear, sorry. Can you call what you want? <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes, I only was trying to, and of course mine is uh, rather as well speculation as yours, but it's nice to speculate. But, um, but yes, I was saying that this, inter this that we, you say that molecule is a message, isn't it a human interpretation? And I said then that plants don't send messages, uh, maybe in this point, so clearly, because they do send molecular, they do send chemical and electronic messages all the time, but when you crap and they eat, do you think that they in that, you would no. call it message? No, I, I, what I'm calling a message is actually a, a molecule. It, it, it's actually the physical um, uh, manifestation of the chemical itself as it, as it hits the neuroreceptor. So, so um, it's not a message in the sense that you and I are delivering messages to each other. Uh, it's a message in that uh, one body is being is being um, um, absorbed by another, a physical body. So, so it's a kind of material, very materialist notion of of what a message is. Um, um, but it, you're absolutely right. This is complete, you know, quixotic speculation <laughs> by a brain which has been infused by these. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't listen to me. I mean, really, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's very problematic. I, that's why I said at the end, do I really want to say this? You know, because that's the jump. That's the that's the problematic jump. Yes, but still, I really very much uh, I'm with you and encourage you to encourage to to go on with that because it is very yeah. interesting and not much discussed in the former studies. Yeah, great. Yes, thank you for the presentation, Ray. Um, and just thinking, living in a post-industrial world, where we have um, we have chemical, we are consuming chemicals, psychotropes that are man-made. So, is there a, is there a profound and really essential difference between psychotropes that are man-made and psychotropes that are that are sort of uh, from our friend friend species? Yeah, 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 yeah. And should we go back to this kind of new ecology of, of psychotropes and drugs in general? Right. Or do you recommend this, or is there a difference? <laughs> do I recommend it? Um, the, uh, the, the, the problem is extinction. So I, I, I see that as, as probably the foremost problem, you know, that we're, that, that everything is facing now. Um, so so um, uh, I would say that that synthetic alternatives is, is an ethical uh, necessity rather than, um, rather than um, continuing to, to harvest from the wild. Um, I, you know, I have, I have friends who have chosen, you know, that, to not eat anything that's wild um, you know, for this reason. So it's a, a different kind of 
um, uh, you know, that's their that's their choice, and, and, and so they only use the farm. But the, the problem is that the farming itself is so destructive. So, so, um, uh, you know, I, I I don't know what the solution to that is, but but um, I think that that plants, you know, the communication of plants is is an essential part of this, and the communication of one species to another. But I see extinction as inevitable um, uh, because we are alpha predators like wily coyote, and and we will always attempt to kill the roadrunner, no matter what the, the 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 repercussions are. So so that that's the problem that I think that we face. That's our dilemma as alpha predators. So isn't that nostalgia? What you are presenting and talking about? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I wanted to make a bridge between your presentation and, and mine insofar as, and I do not want to talk at all against the benefits of tiger milk. <laughs> not at all. My, mother, my mother's ghost will come after you, yes. But you were mentioning the research by Carhart Harris showing that there is greater desynchronization after people take hallucinogens. And I can tell you that in our research we found exactly the same thing when people, high hypnotizables, were having more transcendental type of experiences, we had also greater desynchronization throughout the brain. Mm. Uh, so, it was a different measure than the one we used, but with the EEGs, but it was the same result. Mm. So, what I would say is, yes, the type of may be good, but we already have, in a sense, those capabilities. People do not have as intense experiences in a deep hypnosis kind of procedure, but they do have the same type of experiences and they are gifted to have them. Great, thank you. May I add to that that in our project we found that the, the neurologist uh, talked about the, uh, it, it's the epilepsy attack uh, uh, project we did, that there's a default mode network that sort of controls everything. Um, Sorry for just taking the mic like that, but. Um, it, we, uh, the neurologist found out that there's a default mode network deeply embedded in the brain structure mm -hmm. that keeps control over all the different regions like you were describing mm -hmm. and this epilepsy attack is in fact the shutdown of that default mode network mm -hmm. so everything becomes activated mm -hmm. and they have very profound psychedelic experiences uh, that you know, so that, indeed it's completely embedded already in our mm -hmm. structure I guess so that's very, I mean, when I'm, I'm dyslexic, and and my entry into into my this interest in cognitive science uh, came in order to try to solve the mystery of my dyslexia. Um, uh, and at that time, uh, Gazinaga, I think his name is, uh, was, and and others were doing um, a lot of study of the corpus callosum and 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 the the. Um, there was a radical surgery of the corpus callosum in, in uh, trans, uh, transmus seizures, if I have the, the, the terminology correct, um, uh, of, of epileptics. And, and in order to stop the epilepsy, they were cutting the corpus callosum. And, and, and so bicamerality, a lot of notions of bicamerality came out of that. And I was very interested in bicamerality because I, I saw it as something that um, to, as a way of understanding my dyslexia. But um, how does that relate then? Uh, I, I, what I imagine what you're saying is that the, the uh, epileptic fit has, has um, uh, some um, positive characteristics that are lost then um, through, through this kind of uh, intervention. Right. I, I wouldn't dare answering that question because he, everybody involved in the project was asking the same question. So uh, we, we just simply don't know. But the fact is that um, uh, what was from a medical perspective, the patients uh, were having this love-hate relationship to their own experiences. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was uh, I'm struck by the uh, certain affinities uh, between your, present, your presentation and Peronel's presentation yesterday. Did you did you hear it? Did you see it? 
Uh, no, I no, I didn't know that there was this prelude thing. There was, so I came uh, at there, was yeah. there was a record player as well. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, oh, oh, you mean Tarot? Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, as you just discussed this question, that a molecule can be a message, Tarot basically argued in favor of that kind of reasoning as he spoke about the advent of thought. Mm. I think, which is which is also a kind of element of, of, of the body, so a kind of corporeality as well. So that's another way of thinking about uh, thinking uh, communication. What is communication? An encounter, and uh, uh, your your uh, speculative or not, your your uh, your uh, um, talk anyway it took us at the limits so, uh, of, of scientific explanation and. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you pointed a moment where a, a new, <laughs> new paradigms are needed to, to, to get ahead. And uh, that opens an interesting perspective, perspectives for artistic, uh, artistic research. So why, why don't we, why can't we know what happens in the encounter between the molecule and the receptor? Is it only because of the scale? <laughs> So then let's uh, increase the scale and, and we can do many things like this to enter those areas. Yeah, yeah I think that another um, um, kind of correlation between our two presentations was, was the issue of writing and, and performance um, uh, and, and reading. Uh, and and that, that was, um, um, you know, how, how the uh, the presentations were delivered was was something that I think um, you know I think we're both concerned about in in, 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 a, in our different styles of performance and, and and reading and writing. Yeah. Are there other questions? I uh, might comment yes. once again. No me puedo sin mi mi casa. So only for this molecular uh, molecular and missing thing that of course in, in only clearing my point that of course we can we as humans can think that mole molecule can be a message and we can interpret it and do whatever we wish only my point which was maybe not so clear was that it, we, there is a certain extent to which we can a certain limit which we can uh, apply our thoughts to, to the vegetable world so we cannot, in a way, it, it has its own darkness, which we cannot occupy. Right, so, yeah, so you're saying that shining light is, is, is our light. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, we still have time for one question. Thank you, Ray. I was thinking a lot, so thinking about scale and the molecularization. I was also thinking about, you were talking about clearing and also the setting. And, and I was thinking back to the research that was done when LSD was used as a psychomimetic, I think, in terms of trying to mimic psychosis and what was learned from that. And my understanding was that that molecularization was a potentiality that it could take shape in many different forms and the setting was really important. So and you, you alluded to that, talking about music, colour, but also I think that feeling safe, that, that was a really big issue for people, so having a good trip as opposed to a bad trip. And I was, I was thinking of um, Mary Barnes, you know Mary Barnes, who was one of R.D. Lang's sort of what word is, colleagues, co um, and the Kingsley Hall, where people with psychosis would go to Kingsley Hall so that they could have a safe trip. So I guess I was thinking about the importance of milieu setting, and then, uh, so you talk really well, I think, about the sort of brain body world consciousness but it's that worlding which i think also then you have to start to think about gender and race and class and sexuality so the whole thing of what counts as body within that 
<coughs> distribution. So it's just, yeah, it's kind of thinking back to what we can learn from that because I think also with the voice here is, you know, that, that capability can then become very many different things. So that, 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 that sort of entanglement with however we want to talk to call it, the, the various milieus, it's very difficult and maybe impossible to disentangle. Mm. Disentangle what? Well, the, I guess what I would say, the whole is, you know, historical, cultural, political, yeah. aesthetic, you know, in a sense, the molecular is part yeah. of yeah. that yeah. materialization, but I'd be, yeah. I'd want to not Yeah, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying that culture doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to hone in on, on the neuroreceptors. But, but the, um, one, one of the things that I've been very um, kind of pleased about is, is find, discovering, you know, when I began to go to psychotropic conferences, uh, the therapy sections. Uh, and, and that after the Leary, Alpert, um, the Backel at Harvard, and, and, and that kind of breakdown of the, the connection between academia and psychotropic research, that, um, uh, that actually very quietly there's been a lot of work done on therapeutic uh, conditions and milieu, and, and what is the, 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 the right milieu, what is the right process for for people to to uh, you know who have PTSD or or uh, trauma, uh, other other um, conditions to uh, use psychotropics in in in, um, uh, in therapy, and and that's been going on. Uh, a, a lot of advances happen, and 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 people, some of the some of the um, therapists were talking about how they have solved a lot of the problems of the, the bad trip. Um, be, because the trip is uh, basically um, uh, the, the, the environmental conditions are, are handled. The therapeutic before, during, after um, is, is, is there. So the support mechanisms are there uh, in the therapeutic uh, situation. The, the, um, so that then what is experienced in the, uh, under, in, in the site, psychotropic experience is then processed and able to be processed. And so the bad trip issue has, has been, uh, they're, they're saying has been uh, resolved largely. It's, it, I don't know if that's getting, it's not getting at the cultural aspect, but, it's, but, but that culture, uh, language, all of those would be there in that room. Yes? Yeah. I'll, I'll hear that afterwards. Okay, our time is over. Thank you, Ray.